So good morning, everyone. Thank you for making this a stop on your journey in this morning. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Secretary Halvorsen here today at CSIS to talk to us about Norway's Arctic policy. And we're going to cover uh, this in a way that the Norwegians approach it as well, which is to look at both dimensions of the issue, both security and governance. Um, I had the pleasure of hosting the Henry Bacon moderating uh, the Henry Bacon seminar in May, and the theme there was maintaining predictability in the Arctic. And we talked a lot about the benefits of stability and predictability as we see more commercial uh, and security activity in the region. Uh, but this is, this is challenging, but it's particularly important for Norway. Um, I was looking at the figures. 10% of your population and 80% of your land above the Arctic Circle and the maritime area is seven times the size of the land area. So this is a formidable challenge for Norway um, as things change. And so we're really looking to you and your strategy and your approach to, to lead the way on this. Um, as a brief introduction of the secretary, I was impressed to see that although you're now um, the state secretary, so the, the deputy minister equivalent at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you also have a strong background in defense and the Ministry of Defense. I think we could use a bit more of that cross-pollination here in Washington, but particularly on the Arctic issue, which is so um, cross-ministry interdisciplinary, this is exactly the right portfolio. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you to give us some brief remarks, and then we can open it to guided questions and answers on the topic. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel, for those kind words of, of introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be back here at, at CSIS to share some key priorities on Norway's Arctic policy and also our perspectives on the current developments in the region. And let me start by underlining that Norway appreciates the close dialogue we have with the US on Arctic issues. Our bilateral dialogue on the governmental level, strong security and defense cooperation, both bilaterally and in NATO, cooperation in the Arctic Council between our research communities, and also an increasing regional cooperation between actors in Alaska and Northern Norway, specifically on ocean issues and the development of the blue economy are just some key examples. I believe this contributes to the mutual understanding of our country's views and our positions when it comes to Arctic policy and are to our clear joint benefit. The Arctic remains a key priority to Norway. It has been defined by the government as our most important area of strategic responsibility. 10% of our population live above the Arctic Circle, more than 500,000 people in the Norwegian Arctic, also in major urban centers. In the past year, Northern Norway has experienced solid economic growth, and actually some of our most innovative forward-looking, export-oriented uh, industrial areas are located above the Arctic Circle, driven by an export-oriented ocean industry. There is a large untapped potential in the oceans, including in the Arctic, and Norway believes that it is possible to strike a good balance between sustainable development of resources and protecting the environment. We want to shape a dynamic and vibrant Arctic region with economic and social development that benefits both the people living there and our country as a whole. Thriving and resilient local communities in the Norwegian Arctic are of strategic importance for Norway. Maintaining peace and stability in the region is a fundamental principle of Norway's Arctic policy. Active engagement in several regional cooperation structures, such as the Arctic Council and the Barents Euro-Arctic Council, is an important part of this. And for decades, the eight Arctic states have successfully cooperated on relevant cross-border issues based on common interest and the respect for international law. This is the result of long-term strategies and political choices. And Norway and other Arctic states have worked very hard to maintain this. It is something we also need to work on going forward, and it should not be taken for granted. An extensive legal governance framework already applies to the Arctic. Most resources and activities fall under the sovereignty and national jurisdiction and sovereign rights of one of the eight Arctic states. Consequently, these resources and activities are managed by the host country on the basis of national legislation and international law. In the high seas, the UN Convention of the Law of the Seas applies. 
UNCLOS, often called the Constitution of the Oceans, establishes clarity and predictability with regards to duties, rights, and jurisdiction for all countries. And the Arctic coastal states and the Arctic states all adhere to the law of the sea, formally or in practice. And the Ululisat Declaration of 2008 shows their commitment to this path. A rules-based international world International order with strong multilateral institutions is in Norway's core interest. For more than 20 years, the Arctic Council has been the primary arena for addressing cross-border issues across the Arctic. The Council has been instrumental in setting the agenda, developing new knowledge and building trust across borders. It has also provided a forum for the negotiation of three important legally binding agreements among the eight Arctic states on search and rescue, scientific collaboration and marine oil pollution preparedness and response. Our relations to Russia are a constant factor in Norwegian foreign policy. We share a long border on land and at sea, and this means we have a range of issues that can only be effectively addressed through practical, pragmatic cooperation. Norway maintains close contact with Russia on issues of common interest. Our bilateral cooperation in the north continues, it generally works well in areas such as fisheries management, environmental protection, nuclear safety, coast guard cooperation, border control, and search and rescue at sea. People-to-people -people cooperation across the 198-kilometer Norwegian-Russian border also remains important. But we also need to recognize the military strategic dimension of the region. And over the past few years, Russia has been stepping up its military exercises, including naval exercises off the coast of Norway. These drills are growing in scale, frequency, and complexity. This September, Russia held its largest naval exercise since 1985, Exercise Ocean Shield, moving substantial forces from the Baltic along the Norwegian coast, while simultaneously the Northern Fleet moved out from the Kola Peninsula, in practice deploying large parts of their bastion defense, very close to Norwegian waters. And the Kola Peninsula remains at the core of Russia's strategic interests, housing the world's highest density of nuclear weapons in the shape of the Northern Fleet's SSBNs. New high-end capabilities continue to be tested and deployed in our region, especially in the form of highly capable submarines and new missile technology. And this is something we follow very closely. We do not see Russian military capabilities in the North as directed specifically against Norway but they do pose a strategic challenge to NATO. And we also call on Russia to show more openness about their exercises, including the so-called snack drills. And if Russia is serious about reducing tensions and avoiding misunderstanding in this region, they should show the same openness and provide the same level of notification as NATO does about its exercises and activities. And for Norway and for all the Arctic states, striking the right balance between, on the one hand, maintaining dialogue and cooperation which has been built in the region over decades, while recognizing and addressing the military strategic dimensions, will be key going forward. And we should aim not to abandon the first in pursuit of the second. We also see a renewed allied interest in the region. This is in Norway's and in NATO's overall interest. Also that allied forces exercise on a regular basis in the high north. <clears throat> this is a key contribution to upholding stability and a credible deterrence. The size, frequency, and character of such exercises are coordinated and measured in order to avoid unnecessary escalation and misunderstandings vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Excellent examples is, of course, the U.S. Marine Corps rotational training in Norway, and also NATO's major exercise last year, Trident Juncture 2018. Norway also believes that despite our serious disagreements in the realm of security policy with Russia, it is important to engage and maintain a dialogue also on the political level. So Foreign Minister Eriksen Søreide will meet Sergei Lavrov in Kirkenes, uh, the very northeastern border town of, of Norway, later this week in connection with the 75th anniversary of the Red Army's liberation of Eastern Finnmark, which is the northernmost part of Norway from Nazi occupation in 1944. This was also one of the very few places the Red Army actually left peacefully after the war. Ladies and gentlemen, rapid climate change has opened up prospects for increased human activity in the region. 
There is a renewed focus on the future potential in the Northeast Passage as a transit route between Asia and Europe. In particular, Asian countries are showing continued, albeit more realistic, interest uh, in the passage. As should be well known, earlier this year, Russia introduced new rules with regards to the transit of foreign military and other state vessels through the passage. As a major shipping nation, respect for international law and freedom of navigation remain fundamental to Norway. A discussion about the future of the Northeast Passage must nonetheless take into account many and often very complex legal, political, environmental, and economic issues. And Norway welcomes dialogue with the US and allies on this issue. <clears throat> Let me conclude by touching upon China's increased activities and presence in the Arctic. Also, Norway follows this development closely, as I know uh, is being done here in Washington. And a general principle in our Arctic policy is that we welcome engagement from non-Arctic countries as long as it takes place in accordance with international law and within existing governance structures. And though China is increasing its focus on our part of the Arctic, this has not resulted in many new concrete projects on the ground so far. China's footprint in the region is still quite limited. China does not currently challenge the status quo though we see some signs that they want to play a bigger part in Arctic governance. But I wish to underline China's constructive role as an observer in the Arctic Council. When it comes to Sino-Norwegian Arctic collaboration, we see, for example, developing relations between our research community, but again, also limited presence. The Norwegian government also maintains a close dialogue with regional and local actors in Norway on these issues, in order to maintain a clear, coherent, and predictable policy towards China in the Arctic. So I think I will uh, end my introduction with that, and I look forward to the discussions and your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That showed how rich the discussion can be today with both the security and governance aspects. Um, maybe to begin the conversation on the governance side, you you seem to have a, a high degree of confidence in the existing legal basis and mechanisms that exist, both national um, and, and UN-based. Right now, I think it's correct that China, at least, is cooperating and respecting these rules. What do we do if that starts to change? Uh, we already see Russia challenging some of the boundaries and starting to act more in terms of their own interests rather than terms in terms of the collective interest uh, as has been past practice in the Arctic. As more countries who are active in the region start to push the boundaries of established practice, do we need to update the existing governance mechanisms in any way or establish enforcement mechanisms to compel that cooperative behavior? Well, our, our position is that this is not necessary in the current environment. I think we have seen over the last decades that the Arctic countries, uh, the involved actors, are respecting uh, the governance structures as they, as they are. I think the respect for the, uh, for the law of the seas is important. Uh, even the countries uh, who have not signed uh, UNCLOS, such as the US, regrettably, uh, still respect uh, its rules, which is you know, hugely important. Uh, and you also have a very clear message from uh, not only the Arctic states, but also, uh, sorry, not only the Arctic coastal states, the five, the five countries, but also all the Arctic states, that the um, principles of the Ilulisat Declaration, uh, the respect for uh, the law of the seas, and the regulatory framework that is, exists is still strong. That was uh, reiterated by all the, the actors uh, only last year uh, for the 10th anniversary. I think we also see that we are developing tools for the uh, governance based upon these principles and the already existing framework. Uh, the um, agreement uh, between the five Arctic coastal states, uh, later involving uh, distant fisher, fishery actors such as the EU, China, South Korea uh, and Japan uh, from 2018. Uh, on unregulated fishing in the polar sea. I think it's an excellent uh, illustration of, of how we can use the existing uh, legal basis and framework to actually uh, take, this is a precautionary measure. This is an agreement that was, was uh, signed uh, you know, even though there is no fishing in the international waters 
as, as it is because there is still ice there. So we actually had uh, now you know, 10 countries and actors uh, adhering to uh, this agreement, even though it's probably still years, if not decades, away that it actually will come into to practical uh, implementation. That's good. And in terms of, of those governance structures and <coughs> bodies, like the Arctic Councils or the Barents Council, yeah. are they sufficient to manage the rising geopolitical and security issues in the region? So Russian military buildup and, um, or, you know, because traditionally you've, you've talked about climate, search and rescue, scientific research, all of those fit nicely into the agenda of the Arctic Council and the other existing bodies. Is there a way to build on that cooperation to have a discussion surrounding the geopolitical aspects that we're starting to see? Well, that's, that's a great question and one that often, often comes up. I would, as I alluded to in my, in my remarks, I think we need to maintain both those tracks at the same time. One of the strengths of the Arctic Council has been that there has been a willingness from all uh, the actors, uh, from all the members, to actually keep the, uh, the focus and the discussions, uh, and uh, it's actually, that's the mandate of the Council, based on these uh, Issues that are where we can still cooperate, climate, as you say, environmental issues, uh, search and rescue has been one. Uh, and I also think that we still have, we have established uh, mechanisms uh, on a global scale for uh, discussing, uh, resolving some of these more security oriented uh, problems. Uh, because in that sense, the Arctic is not unique. You know, this is uh, a part of, of, of the globe like, like any other part. And we have, I would say, uh, those necessary frameworks. But I think it's a discussion that we should take. And we should also have it among allies on how we, you know, how, how we deal with that. Uh, it's, not, it's not a given that, I would say, new structures is what is needed. I, no I noticed your use of the word allies during your speech. Mm -hmm. And I think... At least from my perspective, most of the cooperation in what Norway calls the High North or, or even the North Atlantic has been bilateral or trilateral. It's been more hoc, ad hoc rather than within a, with a NATO, within a NATO context. Now part of that is because we have countries in the Arctic uh, that are not members of NATO. But part of that I think has been um, you know, this desire not to make it an issue at, at 28 or 29. Um, what do you? What is your perspective on on the role of NATO uh, in the Arctic? Is there a role beyond the exercise portfolio? Well, f four of the five Arctic coastal states are NATO members. Uh, the fifth, of course, being Russia. Uh, and I would say that f for the last twenty-five years or so, what what you say is completely true. Uh, if you go back to the Cold War, you know, this was seen as one of NATO's uh, sort of core areas of responsibility. You just didn't define it as sort of the high north or the, or the right. Arctic. What we are seeing sort of in the strategic sense is that we have rediscovered the strategic importance of this region. It has always been there, but we, we chose to look away for, for 20 years. And it is now sort of coming back with a vengeance. So, uh, you know, this uh, is... For the four mem NATO members, this is NATO territory. For Norway, uh, this is uh, a core area of, of responsibility still for, for the alliance. And we are seeing engagement activities sort of coming back. Most, a lot of it, as you say, is happening in the bilateral, trilateral frameworks. We have an excellent cooperation steadily increasing with the US uh, on maritime surveillance, uh, on uh, anti -submarine, rebuilding our anti-submarine warfare capabilities. We are seeing a renewed U.S. Uh, presence and engagement in Iceland. Yes. Uh, and also the trilateral cooperation U.S., Norway, U.K., which is increasingly important in light of, of the challenges I, I mentioned, especially the, the submarine uh, dimension. Uh, but I will also say that NATO has been uh, rediscovering and uh, is now addressing some of this, uh, this lack of attention that we have been seeing. I think the decisions made on NATO command structure, uh, the, re the establishment of the Joint Forces Headquarters in, in Norfolk, the U.S. re-establishment of the Second Fleet, uh, and also the new attention being given to, to the maritime domain in, in NATO. And of course, these are 
sort of three, many of these, uh, like the maritime uh, doctrine and, and the new uh, maritime initiatives, these are 360 degree approaches, but they are highly relevant also in the high north. So I would say, uh, you know, together with key allies such as the US and the UK, Norway has been pushing, bringing the, the North Atlantic and, and the high north back to, to, uh, to NATO's attention. Uh, and we are succeeding, and now it's about the implementations of the uh, decisions having been taken at the last summits. So uh, this is uh, NATO, uh, NATO territory. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. I was I, when I when I said not all our members, I was thinking also of Sweden and Finland, mm -hmm. which aren't coastal states, but certainly Arctic Absolutely. nations. Um, and but being close partners, it, it doesn't prohibit their cooperation. But you're right that this evolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, within the alliance has been largely driven by nations who have an interest in the high north and the North Atlantic, pushing that agenda <coughs> and bringing it into a, a NATO context. Um, maybe one more question. Should I just add a comment yeah. to the, when you bring up Sweden and Finland. Because one interesting development that we are seeing is that you know, there is now much stronger recognition that the Baltic, North Atlantic, high north theaters are strongly interlinked. Yes. Uh, you know, the defense of the Baltic starts in the North Atlantic, uh, as you try to bring across troops from, from the US. Uh, and the Russian new capabilities are, you know, could be a severe challenge to the uh, North Atlantic sea lines of communication in a crisis or, or conflict. But that is also, I think, the recognition that is driving uh, a lot of what is ongoing now in the Nordic cooperation on defense, the security policy dialogue, there is a much clearer joint or, or mutual analysis of the situation, of the inter interdependencies. Um, the biggest cargo port in, in Norway is the city of Gothenburg in Sweden. No. So, so we are highly interdependent and I think there is a recognition that any kind of major crisis or, or conflict would not leave uh, any uh, Nordic country uh, outside. Uh, and that is, I think, what is driving Sweden and, and Finland's co the new cooperation with NATO and also the bilateral uh, cooperation with, with the US. So there is a strong Nordic, re Baltic, regional dimension to this as well. Excellent. Um, a final question before I, I turn it over to the audience. I, I saw that your chief of defense released his advice on Norway's next long-term defense plan, which will um, take place next, beginning yes. next year, I believe. Um, as you look at the Arctic, what would you say in terms of um, new investments you'd like to see, either from a Norwegian perspective or from a cooperative perspective among these groups of, of interested nations that you've mentioned? Hmm. Well, we did that analysis uh, for the current four-year uh, long-term plan for defense, which was, uh, which was presented in, in 2016. Uh, and I was part of that working in the, in the MOD. So what we saw was a need for Norway to uh, invest in uh, modern high-end capabilities that both sort of fit our own strategic challenges and build our own national defense, but also uh, fit or uh, close capability gaps within the NATO alliance. And that was what was driving the decision to, to buy new uh, P-8 maritime patrol aircraft, for example, which is a, a hugely important capability uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, buying new submarines uh, and also part of what was, has been driving our uh, you know, heavy investment in uh, F-35. So I, th I think what you see from the Norwegian Chief of Defense is that you know, he, he wants to continue that development uh, to, to uh, sort of strengthen that, that focus even further in the capabilities uh, he would like to, to, for us to invest in. Uh, but I think it also needs a, a very strong focus on um, domains such as space, which uh, is sorely lacking uh, in the high north, both from, uh, and I would say both from a civilian and a military perspective, uh, where we, we need much better uh, satellite, satellite coverage uh, and also uh, the ability to, to protect uh, our own uh, Communication uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have a lot of sea cables, both going between the Norwegian mainland and, and the Svalbard uh, archipelago in the very high north, and also across the Atlantic in, in this area. So there is a need for both uh, individual allies and the alliance as such to, to focus on uh, the capabilities necessary to, to uh, operate in this area. 
And I think not only the capabilities in themselves, but developing uh, the necessary doctrine, uh, regaining the experience from, from actually operating in these areas, yeah. which are extremely harsh. Uh, and I believe that is also part of what has been driving the US Marine Corps decision to, to renew their uh, rotational training and exercise presence in, in Norway, working with the Norwegian Armed Forces uh, to the strong mutual benefit of both. So. Absolutely. All right, well, I could keep going, but I won't. So I'll turn it over to audience questions. Krista is standing in the back. Um, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, and she'll come over to you with, with the microphone. Yes. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. So um, I feel very confused. <laughs> Um, so my name is Anita Parlo. I worked on the Harvard-MIT Arctic Fisheries Project and the Wilson Center founding team lead for the Polar Program, and I've just finished up a consultancy advisory for the Port of Nome, which likes, would like to be Kirkinus one day, I'm sure. Um, so my question is, you, bring, you mentioned NATO, international waters, warming, reshift re in, in commerce, oil, gas, mining, shipping. Um, and, and the standards and in international law that would apply and then the role of China as, as it moves um, forward, particularly in um, interrelationship with Russia commercially and then also with Iceland, with Greenland, um, really on both sides of, of the Arctic, if I can say it like that. And um, NATO enlargement, is that, is that what we're ultimately talking about as a security issue? And if so, does that automatically divide the Arctic in half? Um, and is, from Norway's perspective, is Russia an existential threat that needs to be treated that way at all levels? And how do you bring together, I'm not sure I'm saying this coherently, but uh, the, the cooperative uh, dimension, such as the IUU and search and rescue and spill response and uh, the, the interactions that, that occur um, with, with respect to Russia and, uh, and then the larger sort of submarine satellite in the sky, um, uh, you know, ki kind of approach to, to security. How do those, do those pieces collide potentially? Or how do you thread the needle, so to speak, so that the security uh, issues are, are taken care of, but yet the capabilities of functioning, and particularly as a whole new ocean, the size of the Mediterranean is going to open up. Mm. Um, well, big question. Uh, first, do we see Russia as an ex existential threat? No, we do not. Uh, the Norwegian uh, approach to, to Russia, being it uh, uh, Tsarist Russia of the early 20th century, be it the Soviet Union for 70 years, or today's Russia, has always been that uh, we need to coexist with a big, uh, very often challenging, uh, but still a, a neighbor. And you know, a historical fact is that the Norwegian-Russian border uh, has been peaceful for a thousand years, uh, and is the only border Russia has that has been peaceful for you know, within that time frame. So for us. And going back to decades, I think the Norwegian policy has always been sort of this two-pronged two approach. On the one hand, we have been you know, a firmly committed member of NATO, a founding member of NATO. Uh, we've had a strong bilateral relationship with the US in addition to the NATO uh, membership. We have never sort of compromised on our core interests on the, on the, or values. Uh, in meeting either the Soviet Union or uh, an authoritarian uh, Russia. But we have used sort of that firm platform as a fundament to, to engage them on issues where it is possible. Because we, we have you know, tens of thousands of people living in the high north close to the border. You have hundreds of thousands of people uh, living on the Russian side. Historically, there have been very close links across that border. Trade. Uh, people moving across the border, marrying across that border, families sort of living on, on either side, going back through history. And also in light of, of the uh, history since the Second World War, a strong sense in Northern Norway of gratitude towards the Soviet army uh, liberating Northern Norway. 
So the relationship has been maintained in, I would, as I said, in a practical, pragmatic way. Uh, we have four formal bilateral commissions between Norway and Russia. They meet annually. Uh, they have functioned as a formal framework for cooperation and uh, engagement, uh, even throughout the, the last five years when the sort of uh, surrounding security environment has become increasingly challenging. And it works. The Russians are uh, willing also to engage in a constructive manner on these issues of mutual interest. Nuclear safety being one you know, important issue for Norway. But we actually have you know, huge stockpiles of, of uh, spent uh, nuclear fuels just uh, 60 kilometers from the Norwegian border. So these are, you know, this engagement is not something we do out of a sort of uh, naive belief that we can, uh, can uh, uh, get the Russians to agree on everything, but because it's in our uh, common interest. Uh, fisheries management, which I mentioned. We have a joint management uh, through this commission uh, with the Russians. Uh, of the Barents Sea cod stocks. They are probably the best managed fish stocks in the world, where you have the value growing you know, uh, significantly each year. I think th this year's uh, quota has a joint value of some $2.5 billion in Barents Sea cod alone. So we are trying to engage on, on a lot of these uh, you know, civilian practical uh, issues which are important for the welfare and the safety and security of our populations on either side of that border. But that does not mean that we, we can sort of look away from the security dimension of this. And the fact alone that you know, the Russian submarine bases on the Kola Peninsula is something that Russia will defend in any major global uh, crisis or conflict, that has huge security implications for Norway. Because they will do this in a way that you know, directly, uh, basically, happens across uh, our waters, uh, and with consequences for our possibility to to uh, to trade and and to to work with our partners. So it's, um, as I said, a dual pronged approach, uh, but it's uh, one that has been working well for Norway uh, for for decades, and which we try to maintain, even though the environment is is more challenging. Others? In the back, please. Hi there, uh, Kate Boffman, CNA. Um, so I have a couple of quick questions. The first of which is building on this last question um, in relation to Russia and its activities in uh, Svalbard. I've, I know that um, in the last several decades, those activities have tapered off in the economic realm. A lot of uh, coal mining has become less and less lucrative, uh, and yet there's a lot of money being invested in maintaining that presence there. What do you think is, um, is motivating that extra effort um, to retain a presence there? Um, and then also, I know that there's been a some concern among the uh, analytic community in Russia that Norway might limit fishing or, or somehow um, exert more prohibitions on, on those activities? Are those at all founded? Thank you. Hmm. Well, Svalbard is, of course, the, the northernmost part of Norway. It's an archipelago with, with several islands, uh, some big, some small. It has a population of some 2,500 people. Uh, traditionally, it has been a mining community. Uh, and. Uh, Svalbard is Norwegian territory. Uh, Norway, according to the Svalbard Treaty and according to, to uh, uh, practice in, in international law, has full and indisputed sovereignty over Svalbard. But then the Svalbard Agreement uh, allows for, or it has a non-discrimination clause. So the businesses and uh, citizens of the signatories are awarded equal rights to uh, hunting, fishing, uh, and certain commercial activities within the archipelago as such. And that uh, clause has served as the basis for the Russian uh, presence uh, at Svalbard, uh, which has been, as, as you say, uh, very strongly connected to, to uh, mining. There used to be a much larger presence than it is today. Uh, today it is limited to uh, a village called Barentsburg, 
uh, where uh, the Russian mining company Trust Arctic Kurgol uh, has approximately 450 uh, workers, uh, most of them Ukrainian, by the way, uh, working uh, still uh, extracting coal. Uh, and as you say, the, the, uh, the uh, commercial market for coal is, has uh, decreased substantially. Uh, but the, there is still activity ongoing uh, and also export from, from, uh, from the community there. Uh, I think there is no doubt that uh, the Russians still want a, a foothold, uh, so to say, uh, in, in Svalbard. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the relationship is working well. They respect the rules and regulations set out by Norwegian authorities. Uh, there was a major helicopter accident involving a Russian helicopter some years back. And what we saw was actually that the, the cooperation between the Norwegian uh, authorities, uh, which of course have full jurisdiction in the archipelago, and uh, the Russians worked out very well. It worked out according to, to uh, the agreed procedures. Uh, the cooperation in the search and rescue operation uh, were uh, efficient. They uh, respected uh, Norwegian jurisdiction and the rules. Uh, and there is a, an ongoing dialogue, uh, I would say, where, where we have a, a good contact between the Norwegian governor of, of Svalbard uh, and the Russian community there, where they're also, they also have a general consulate uh, in Bidensburg attached to, to the mining uh, activity. Uh, and uh, even though Norwegian coal mining is uh, decreasing and will you know, basically uh, be ended now within a brief uh, period of time. Uh, we are you know, looking at ways we can uphold uh, the livelihood of the community there. Uh, the biggest city is, or village is called Longyearbyen. It has uh, approximately 2,200 inhabitants. Uh, and we are looking at ways to, to maintain uh, the Norwegian presence, the Norwegian uh, lively, or livelihood of the families living there uh, in a way that is uh, sustainable uh, for the environment as well because what we are seeing is that of course the climate change is having huge implications for the soil ball with uh, glaciers the snow melting uh, at the, twice the speed that you are seeing uh, elsewhere in, in, uh, in the, on the globe but <coughs> there are no plans to, to uh, to limit fishing there are uh, as I said we have uh, annual consultations uh, with uh, the Russians and other uh, involved uh, fishing actors. Uh, it happens uh, based on scientific evidence. We have uh, joint research uh, uh, vessels or we have joint uh, research uh, being done every year between uh, Norwegian Russian uh, researchers sort of uh, making that scientific foundation for, for the annual fisheries. Uh, and we see that you know, on the general level, uh, some few exceptions, uh, there is also respect for uh, the Norwegian management and, and jurisdiction of, of the fisheries in the region, not only from the Russians, but in a broad sense. So. Question. Anyone else? So maybe, maybe another one from me then. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, you've talked a lot about these, these activities that sound, um, you know, benign. So, um, you know, the presence on Svalbard in terms of, of mining or other economic activities, um, some, some of the Chinese economic or scientific activity in the region. Um, the Danes saw a case uh, within the last year of a, you know, I think it was a Swiss a Swiss um, research agency that chartered a ship that was going to, for scientific purposes, sail around the coast of Greenland making port stops. Um, and, you know, it was allegedly for scientific purposes, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided that there was enough of a security concern that they stopped that. Uh, we had a similar situation in Finland not so long ago um, with an island in the Swedish Finnish archipelago being occupied you know, presumably for a summer house, but I've never seen a summer house with so many, you know, uh, bathing bridges and helipads, helipads and communications yeah. equipment. So is there a mechanism um, in, in Norway, as you look at 
activity in the Arctic and the high north to assess this risk and this possibility of, of kind of what we call dual use or dual purpose activities? I think it's a, it's a challenge that we you know, have increasingly become aware of. And not only from, from the Norwegian side, but I think for all the actors in, in the region. Uh, the examples you point to from, from Finland is, is obviously one. So uh, we have sort of beefed up our attention uh, to these issues through our uh, security services, the police. But as I also briefly mentioned in my, my remarks, we, from the foreign ministry side, we try to maintain a very close, regular dialogue with uh, the other involved actors uh, in the high north. Uh, academic institutions, uh, local and regional uh, governments, to, to get the sense of what is going on and also to, to help them in addressing uh, you know, what they see as, as the challenges. And of course, for, for a small Norwegian municipality somewhere in, in the very top north of, of Norway, uh, certainly getting an interest from some uh, Chinese uh, city uh, wanting to, to be a friendship city or uh, uh, having a visit from a huge delegation uh, wanting to invest, that presents a lot of, of problems. So we have sort of stepped up that, that regular dialogue, and I would say it works very well. We have not seen these more blatant examples of, of uh, what you are describing in, in Norway so far, but we are very aware of, of the risk, and that is you know, part of what is driving uh, a lot of what we are now doing, uh, we will present a new white paper to Parliament on uh, high north uh, issues or, or active policy next year. Uh, obviously taking into account the new uh, or the re-emerging security and, and military dimensions of the region, but also on how to strengthen uh, the resilience of, of local communities and build sort of the, the uh, necessary trust between uh, the regions and the, the uh, central government in Oslo. So uh, I think we are, we are uh, very aware of, of the challenge, but, uh, but so far uh, we have been spared from some of that more uh, obvious uh, interference. That's great. It's really interesting to hear about the white paper on the high north and the involvement of the indigenous communities. I believe Denmark is also reviving its uh, Arctic policy, but this time with the inclusion of, of representatives from the Faroe Islands and the Greenlandic Home Rule. So this idea of including the people who are the recipients of uh, you know, the, the investment or the influence um, is, is really, I think, a, a turning point. OK, second time. There's no one else? No problem. This is remarkable. Useful, interesting. Um, if I could follow up on the, <clears throat> the question of um, China, mm -hmm. um, it would seem that there's, uh, well, not it would seem. What do you think? <laughs> there, there have been actions, uh, for example, in Iceland, there was an effort by, just following on, uh, there was an effort by, a, I, I don't know that it was a Chinese private interest or not, to purchase the largest farm in Iceland that was around uh, Finjefjord, and, and that uh, wasn't allowed to pass. And then with respect to Greenland, there was an effort um, on the part of Chinese interest to, um, to uh, refurbish or create or build three airports, and, and Denmark said no. And uh, US has then financed uh, some of the um, one airport uh, development. And with respect to the Polar Silk, uh, uh, Polar Belt and Road, Polar Silk Road, uh, and the uh, interlinks commercially uh, between Russia and China is, is quite substantial, even to the point of Russia making its rules of the road uh, that are applied to China uh, in, in terms of uh, icebreaker escorts and, and this sort of thing. So does it, and to your earlier uh, remarks, your earliest remarks, where you talked about as long as you follow the rules of the road, um, you know, uh, everybody's welcome, so to speak, and particularly if we're now at some point be talking about international waters. Does it matter uh, whether China is a dominant force uh, uh, helping to shape and define what moves in the future and that the U.S., if I may, with its one icebreaker, um, is, becomes less of a dominant force commercially uh, speaking in the region. Is that, is that a security issue? Does that matter? Is it everybody's welcome as long as the rules are applied uh, equally and then who gets to define and shape the rules as, as the road 
you know, enlarges. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Well, from the Norwegian perspective, of course, we, we hope uh, and believe that the U.S. will remain constructively engaged in the region also in the future. I think that is uh, extremely uh, important and, and would be, would be a, a strong factor in actually keeping developing the, the Arctic region as a, as a stable and, and a prosperous place for, for the people who, who live there. And as I said, when it comes to the Chinese engagement, uh, to, to be a bit direct, I think it, it is a bit hyped in my uh, sense. Uh, because when you look at how it is actually, how concrete it is on the ground, uh, it is still rather limited. You, have, you mentioned Iceland. Uh, yes, there was a lot of discussion on, on the buying of massive properties some years back, but it didn't happen. Uh, the, the, bar, the, the purchase of a deep water port didn't happen. You are seeing you know, much of that. It's sort of, it rises very rapidly to the tension, and then the fact that it doesn't actually take place sort of gets lost. So I don't think we should be naive when it comes to the potential uh, interest and, and the ambition. But I think given the renewed awareness from the Arctic states as to, to the challenge this could present, and, and you point to the Danish example, which I think is an excellent one. Because in light of the attention that was given to critical infrastructure in Greenland, the Danish government intervened. And they said, we will finance this ourselves. So I think there is a lot more reluctance now among the Arctic actors in actually uh, allowing, what should I say, uh, potentially strategically important investments. And that, that it's not only for the Arctic, but this is something you are seeing all across Europe on the discussions with the EU on uh, investment screening, for example, on sensitive technology, on telecom sector and 5G, and also on critical infrastructure. infrastructure. So I think the, the awareness about the, the challenge is, is so much higher that it's much more difficult to penetrate. That does not mean that we should, you know, all, as a general rule, exclude China from being present or operating within as I mentioned, the established framework. Norway, for example, is an open uh, competition-based economy. Uh, but we have strict regulations when it comes to, to investment as well. And we have high standards of, of uh, quality, uh, labor standards, for example, which also uh, you know, can be used to, to make sure that the competition is, is genuine and based on uh, commercial factors, not political influence. So, I think we should, uh, we should be aware uh, and vigilant as to the challenge, but we should not be paranoid uh, when it comes to, to what is actually happening. Uh, and that goes for, for investment, and I would also say for uh, research uh, cooperation, as, as you mentioned, where of course it is, uh, on, a, on an issue like climate change, for example, it is hugely beneficial to have China on board. Uh, also in, in sort of making the scientific foundation for, for uh, the measures that have to be taken going forward. Well, we're, we're about finished here, um, and I want to give you the opportunity for, for any closing remarks, but I think we've, we've heard some pretty important things here today. Um, you know, my takeaways from your, your, your remarks was that there is a framework in place that's worked pretty well uh, for the last few decades. And we're making the adjustments we need as things change in the region and new actors appear. Um, but while you're aware of the risk, there's no need to, to sort of reinvent things. Um, also in terms of the security dimension, I think Norway has been very successful in, in pulling the alliance along, pulling the EU along, pulling along the other Nordic allies and Baltics. So, so I think we're in a, in a good place. Um, and we can also learn from your approach to Russia the pragmatism and the dialogue, uh, which helps balance some of the yeah. deterrence and defense aspects of, of what we need to do to keep, keep ourselves safe. Yeah. Um, but with that, any, any closing remarks or thoughts uh, before we, we wrap things up? Well, I don't really have much to add, add but <laughs> I would like to, to thank the audience and to, to CSIS for inviting me here. Uh, it's really been, uh, been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, Norway always stands ready to, to work with uh, friends and partners and also to engage with, with the research and academic community here in the US on matters related to, to the Arctic, to the high north, and also to transatlantic security and, and cooperation. So uh, it's an important relationship, and we, we highly appreciate it. Great. So uh, 
Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, thank you.